Hello, everyone. It's a red Monday. Let's have a great week. Hello, uh, SH and Paul, how are you? And Sinatra, Hugo, and Brock, Alexander, my trading warrior brother. So let's take a look around, see what kind of damage is being done. So starting off with something I've been pounding the table on for a while. Uh, if you recall, I was talking a few weeks ago about these kind of wicks in the VIX that smacked of accumulation. Then last week I said we could be carving out a right shoulder with S&Ps and NASDAQ making new highs. We didn't get close to the prior week's highs. Okay, so we'll see if we could hold this, if we get a breakout or they try and turn it back one more time, but it's either head and shoulders or descending triangle, uh, ascending triangle, which if we start closing over that red line, uh, looks like 28 would be the measured move there. Okay, so uh, regarding S&Ps, and they're trying to bounce off this uh, 200 day on the four hour, uh, let's look at the daily. So uh, the uh, 50 days coming in around 42.40. Uh, the key I want to mention, and I'll, I'll tell you, I doubted that it would happen for a while early in the week, but we did get a two-week reversal in the S&Ps. This was last week's close at 43.23, and the two-week reversal was... 4349. So if you took the signal on Friday, you have a nice lead of 41 points, even though you didn't sell the top. Okay, so and it's still early in my view. Still think that we're going to get follow through. And I don't know why 3900, 3800 isn't a possibility. Uh, also, um, I stayed negative at the end and put some more shorts out on this. Rally here, shorted it last week here, reshorted Friday here. Still looking for uh, under 108, the 108 handle. And uh, talked about how I thought yields would sell back off and head towards this blue speed line, which we're not quite there yet. It's going to come in around 118, depends on 117. And with this going on, Dixie's making a new high. And I think one thing that changed last week, and I'm not going to chase chase it right here, is Euro pound. Uh, I think that we could have a two week reversal here. So I'm open to buying a pullback, maybe around 85 and a half, 85, 40, risking the lows, because if we start to penetrate this resistance, which we're attempting to do right now, um, I see a lot of confluence coming in. Uh, right around the 88 level. Let's look at the weekly, see how these two moving averages are converging at the 88 level. Um, I think that's viable. Of course, you have to manage the risk. And if you buy a pullback, um, you risk last week's low. Uh, Peter Goodburn will be joining us today. Uh, we'll ask Peter if last week's reversal week, uh, he calls it a reversal signature was enough to be the onset of this correction he's looking for. Stick around for this, especially if you're a commodity person. Um, could save you some grief over the next couple months. And uh, with all that being said, um, good morning to you, Blake Morrow. How are you, buddy? You know, good going? morning, Dale. How are you? Good, buddy. What's um, new? What's that? What's new? Um, well, you know, this, I mean, this is the first time I think we've stepped in a North American trade where, um, yeah. you know, the S and P is down like a percent that yeah. doesn't happen. It's been a while. Yeah. It's been yeah. A it while. has been a while. Um, but I, I, I really want to point this out really quick. Um, let me just grab the charts really fast. And, um, and, and I think this is something that, you know, you know, we have to obviously pay attention to, by the way, how was your weekend? Uh, nice, very nice uh, indoors, you know, 
six, seven hours a day, you know, it doesn't cool off. Last night didn't cool off hardly at all. Yeah, so, we, know, it's kind of an inside lifestyle. It, it is this time of year when you live in the desert, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's gross. Uh, and yeah. we, um, you know, I, I talk to all, like all my friends that live in cold weather environments and they, they get the same, you know, dilemma yeah. in the wintertime. The winter, yeah. Summertime, we just stay inside. Uh, as much as possible anyway um you, you have, know, you have some talking, nice tips you have some nice pattern in place working jay uh blake thank you you know um i'm i'm going to be taking the aussie off probably fairly soon we we i i don't know if i want to let it reach to uh i mean it'll eventually i think make it to 7250 but uh, let me let me just kind of pull up a, a few things so okay. as far as the SP goes here's the uh here's the ascending wedge um everybody knows it's kind of the ascending wedge that's working in the market right now. We are down a percent, um, and you know, nearing what I think is 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 really key support around the seventy-two or a uh, seventy-two, forty-two fifty, forty-two sixty level. Um, and we we're breaking through some support. And I guess the the thing that we should notice, and, and this is where I'm going to stop here for a moment on this uh, this four hour chart, we are going to be making. And we already have now, depending on how far we go here, we've already made lower lows. So that's important. Okay. Yeah. Now we are still making higher highs. You can see how this is uh, let's stop here. There's uh, there's a high, here's another high, right? So, so at this point we're making higher highs, lower lows. So now the question will be if we do bounce, like let's say we get a, a, a Let's say we Will it a, be a failing rally or give us a new high? Right. Well, are we going to do a lower high? And then if we if we do actually do a lower high, then I think we will break down. That's that's that would be my opinion. Uh, maybe I'm being a little exaggerated with that line, but I'm not. I don't really think I am. Sorry. I think that's going to be really key going into um, going into uh, this next um, you know this next couple of days I, I I'm, I'm well first of all i wonder if we're going to even bounce here so that that's going to be or where we're going to bounce from uh, i guess the question is going to be do we bounce from below this trend line so it becomes really more of a a, a deci divide, decisive breakdown um today or does it you know does it bounce from that trend line and then you know then then we all question whether or not um uh, we're, we're actually, you know, seeing a bearish reversal or not. So that's, that's important. Um, that, that's something that I want to talk about or wanted to talk about. And I, I, can, I guess I can go reference the Aussie as well, because we did talk about this on the week ahead video, just, um, you know, just yesterday. Um, you guys would have seen it on yes, yesterday on Sunday. Uh, so the, the Aussie continues lower. We are hitting the 161% extension. We're trading below it right now. Obviously, it's going to be down as you have the S&P, the NASDAQ, the, the, um, the, uh, the Dow, you know, breaking down as well. But the Aussie, you know, has further to drop, in my opinion. I still think we, we are going to reach for the 7250 level. But if you don't recall our conversations from last week, on the face webinar. I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure we talked about it here. You know, it's interesting when you, you know, if you're in my, my, my shoes, you do, you know, a face webinar, then we do the morning edge webinar, which is about an hour from now. Um, but that's exclusive to the Forex analytics subscribers. There's some things that I'm, I'm like, m most things I can say, Oh, I talked about that on face, you know, on our free webinars, a lot of, a lot of times I'm like, did I really discuss that on the morning edges or did I talk, talk about it on the morning edge? Did I really mention that on face? And sometimes I can't remember. And this is one of those situations where uh, anybody that's been following my analysis with Forex analytics on a daily basis to our exclusive webinars, they know that my target is, you know, we're in the target zone right now because, you know, we're in the target zone here because this is the previous target, or this is the 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 uh, the minimum target of the of the triangle um, breakdown. This was my um, my 
my uh, uh, bigger target, and actually we could probably go even further than that if we really want to. So if you take those two levels and you take us in between, oops, you take us in between those two levels, we're already there. So um, we're already in like the target zone for the Aussie dollar, even though the Aussie continues to break down here, we are, we are really, you know, we've already reached for it. So anyway, I think the Aussie can bounce, but that, that really is gonna be dependent on if the S&P can find some support down here. And right now I think the S&P has another 20 points or so before we, we, we really find out. Now we, we have this 200 period um, moving average on a four hour chart, but I don't think that's given us much support. If you look at previous, you know, previous time intervals or previous um, uh, moves below that 200 day, 200 period moving average, that hasn't provided a whole lot of support. So I don't think it's going to do that right now. I'm, I'm more, I would be more focused on how we react down here at the 4250 level. So again, some pretty big, uh, Pretty big moves are happening overnight. We've seen, um, you know, the euro. I guess I should talk about the euro as well, Dale. Um, the euro dollar is Break. at yeah breaking that big trend line you showed it, last week. It, it is, and uh, if you were listening to the um, the week ahead video, I even had you repeat that number back to me at one seventeen seventy five. You can see we're trading below it right now. Now, just because we're trading below it doesn't mean, oh, you know, we're trading below it and, and, and we're breaking down. Remember, support and resistance levels is not an exact science. But when we reach for a level, like I believe this 117, uh, 117.75 level is so important that once we're here, you have to be paying attention. So we may be trading below 117.75. You, you might, you might, some people might say, oh, we're below 117.75. I need to short it. That's never the answer for me. For me, it's like, oh, we're at, we're, we're trading below 117.75. I need to, I need to start looking to see, you know, are we going to close below this? Are we going to, you know, are we going to accelerate now that we've broken below it? Are we going to, um, you know, bounce from these levels? You know, this is a pivotal area in the Euro. I think, uh, you know, if, if, if I, if I just look at this, you know, level as it is, you know, a daily close below here. Yeah. I think, you know, we get a daily close below, like, let's just say 117.75, probably 117.50. We're going to trade down towards 116 and change, you know, flip side is if we, we close back above 118 today, I wouldn't want to be on the short side either. So I think today's going to be a very pivotal day for the Euro dollar, especially with the ECB later this week. So Anyway, just a just a few things I, I wanted to note as we go into Monday uh, morning uh, here, and um, so Dale, what else are, what else is on your radar? What else are you looking at right now? Uh, well, uh, a little surprised that there's continued, uh, not completely, but you know the U.S. dollar yen looks uh, negative to me too from last week. I thought we could see it under the 108 handle. You know the the guys in our in our chat room were just talking about the uh, the move lower in the dollar yen, but um, I guess what we should reference um, with that move lower in the dollar yen is we yes. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to this chart, so don't don't go anywhere with the dollar yen. Um, well, don't forget that was my part. rationale for the short yen, as I thought that yields would. Uh, take yeah. out the lows again yeah they, they are and so here if you look at the daily chart this is the thing that we were just talking about if if you go into our here let's uh here's our chat room guys so you can just so you guys know that hey we were talking about this just a few moments ago um oh wait hold on oh is that the i want to make sure that's the room that we were talking about um So that we were just talking about yields. Uh, I don't know where the. Uh, oh, here, here it is. Um, Ryan's. Yeah, we were just talking about yields, and then we were talking about the um, the. Uh, let me move that over. 
the uh, being below the 200 day moving average in the 10 year and that and, and notice how we're making new trend lows. Now, I would say that w there's further support down here, but the fact of the matter is we're making lower highs or excuse me, lower lows in, in the 10 year. And so and we're also breaking below this um, this previous support and that we had referenced last week. So that's something to note as well. And and I think that that breakdown in in uh, in yields you know, the, the rally that we're seeing here in bonds is really weighing on that yen. Now, you know, with the dollar yen moving lower. Now, here's here's the one thing I want to talk about the dollar yen really quick, going back to the four hour chart. Let me, uh, I'm going to stop here for a second because I just want to say that if the, the you have yields that are hitting new trend lows, that should mean the dollar yen breaks down. Now, here's here's the other thing I want you to think about. How about if it doesn't? Meaning... How about if we actually, you know, how about if 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 you start to see uh, yields bounce in the dollar yen, you know, not break this support? I wouldn't want to be short then. Is I guess the point I'm trying to make. If for some reason we see, you know, bonds come back off, we see yields bounce. I wouldn't want to be on the short side of the dollar yen because that means that we're respecting this support. So use it from a correlation standpoint. I think. I think that's the way we should uh, we should look at it. But flip side to all this is, you, you know, the equity markets are taking are are taking a cue off of yields. Yields are down, um, stocks are are weak. Nasdaq's off pretty aggressively this morning. Um, you know, down one percent. You know, the one part of the correlation that's not holding up with the lower yen is normally that would be supportive for precious metals, and for two days now it hasn't had any impact on the weakness of precious metals. Yeah, and you know what also is interesting, gold was actually just bouncing when I when I woke up this morning. When I woke up this morning, I looked at gold and I saw gold was actually, um, where is, where's my gold chart here? Back the uh, other way. I think I just skipped over it. Yeah. Uh, got it. Okay, where is it? There it is. Uh, you know, when I, when I woke up this morning, you know, we were here. I was like, "Oh, look at that!" You know, gold. and I was thinking the exact same thing you were. Um, you know, hey, there's gold firming up. You know, and and then all of a sudden, you know, bottom fell out of gold, which is it, it is interesting that we're seeing that move. You know, yeah. so good, good, uh, good point. Um, looks like copper is also moving as well. Oh God! This look. this gold move is uh, good morning, everybody. This gold move is just the classic reaction to stronger dollar. Um, you know, the, 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 pro the problem there is, is that we're seeing inflation everywhere. And now with COVID, this Delta variant dominating now, uh, this is giving uh, central banks uh, reason to kind of avoid tapering or, or prolong, uh, the, the, you know, when they're going to start tapering or, or hiking all of that. So we have higher inflation and central banks kind of have a reason to wait a little bit longer. So what happens? What's your inflation hedge? You know, that's... Um, yeah, true. But anyway, yeah. You know, you know speaking of the COVID, uh, you know, uh, whatever, Delta variant, and I know people are like worried about it and stuff. Um, I, you know, unless I see the death, like death toll start to really, really rise. I, I'm, I, I think this is a gross exaggeration right now of, uh, you know, over, over, over reaction of this of this delta variant I, I really don't think it's maybe in the u.s blake but look around the world i mean yeah I mean, you know, you're you're right maybe because we're yeah. but because of our vaccination numbers. we're higher and i'll tell you uh, israel is the highest vaccinated country in the world and they're one of their top epidemiologists said the vaccine's not going to be enough protection and they're going to a third shot and also if you read they make it sound like it's weird uh rare there are a lot of breakthrough cases of people getting it, um, even though they're fully vaccinated. And, yeah, I yeah, mean, but I getting it, I, look, getting it is not a problem. Yeah, it, it's, oh, it is a problem. Uh, a lot of people, I've seen some people, uh, read some articles, Steve, that uh, for the person that got it, a breakthrough case, they were pretty sick. And uh, if it was you, you would probably think it was a problem. You, you you know well here here's the thing let's not get in a covid discussion i just think that the markets were overreacting personally now okay. that doesn't mean that doesn't mean 
it actually it probably doesn't mean more than anything i think what we have have or it doesn't mean anything what we should do is just pay attention to the to the charts really here and i think that all right. tells where, yeah, sure where we're at. but but I, I i would say i would agree with what dale said that it's not as big of a deal here in the u.s um because of our vaccination rates are so much higher than yeah but you can't claim at the same time that higher vaccination rates make it not a problem but no. even if you're vaccinated it's a problem i mean one of the two has to be true and the other one okay. false. Let, 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 let me, let me, let me <laughs> you know, wait wait let me rephrase what i said i don't think it's a big deal to the markets i think the markets are overreacting you know i whether agree with you people, whether i'm with people, you whether or not whether or not whatever people decide to do you know it, i mean they're going to decide to do i'm just saying that the markets i think are are reacting right now and i think they're overreacting i don't know if the delta variant is going to be as big of an issue but i think the markets are reacting to they, they're looking for a reason i think when you hear like oh stocks are down because of the delta variant i think the markets that's just journalists searching for something i think the markets are really overbought and we're just correcting towards trendline support and we're still in a wedge so I, I don't know if I'd get overly aggressively bearish the market yet, unless we start breaking down. I guess that's the point I'm trying to make. If that, if that, that makes, makes sense. I agree with you, Blake. I agree. That makes okay. sense. Yeah. So let's not, you know, let's not, you know, point the finger at, you know, just get carried away, point the finger. Oh, it's this because of this or that. And the other thing, look, you know, we're, we're really just nearing support and, and we, we are pretty oversold as far as, you know, you look at some of these currencies against the dollar um, you know, we're, we've got some pretty oversold, overbought conditions with the dollar index. Uh, I do think the dollar is actually probing some pretty key resistance right now. And, and I think that really the catalyst that's going to drive um, us into, a, into this breakout, whether this breakout is going to be real or not, is going to be more of a, a product of the ECB versus anything else but you know maybe i'm wrong we still have a few days to that and we are before that and we're still probing some pretty big resistance okay but uh steve stelios uh dale yeah so i just wanted to make a point that i think people are quick to point the finger at covid and, and i oh and there I, are other things you know i mean uh, do you ever think of the narrative guys uh, i'm addressing all of you guys that you know all the fed uh uh, the chairman and governors are saying we're in uh, pretty good shape to start a taper uh, at the end of the year. So is that the all clear? People were no. interpreting it as the all well, clear till, and then you could just w stay long. And at the end of the year, when they start to taper, then uh, it'll be right to sell. Yeah. And that, and that's, that's the other thing really it's, it, you know, it's probably going to be more, you know, what, what is, what the feds um you know how people view what the fed's doing over the course of the next couple of uh couple of months really as we head into you know jackson hole so that next month is really gonna you know help everybody determine you know whether this mark market's really going to come off you, you know you pull away you know su support from only the fed but other central banks too um and that's yeah. obviously going to be a problem on asset prices and that's going to continue to give the dollar a boost uh, and it's probably going to weigh on yields. So, um, Stelia, Steve, uh, good morning, guys. What are you guys thinking here with the, with all these moves? Now, I know Stelia, so you, you had your opinion about gold. Um, Steve, what what are you what are you seeing right now? What are you thinking? Uh, first of all, we're finally getting some moves now, having to do with gold. Since Stelia mentioned it and, and silver, I was, despite being bullish in the medium to long term, I I, I was constantly saying that. It looks to me like they want to have one more low, so I I like the fact that that they they're attempting to do so. I would I would be more than happy to buy it lower, to buy them, actually lower. Um, I think in the case of silver we can see a move even towards 23. In the case of gold, I wouldn't be surprised to see an, a retest of 1680. Um, now having to do with risk off, as you said, I'm you know I'm I'm quite skeptical because we're finally seeing equities trying to do some catching up with yields. But I'm extremely skeptical that this move lower in yields can continue for much longer due to the macro conditions that prevail at the moment, which make it completely illogical for this move to continue unfolding much longer. You can, you can have moves that don't make much sense 
uh, in the short to medium term, uh, but long term, they, they're not sustainable, even if we're talking about the bond market, which is obviously at a huge extent manipulating because the, the biggest buyer there is central banks. So, you know, it's not a fully uh, free market in movement, but still it has to somewhat depict at least in direction the underlying fundamentals. And currently what we do know as a fact is that uh, we, we have uh, inflation that's exploding higher and theoretically speaking, uh, the result of this seems to be um, that people are uh, happy to receive even less yield. Now, there is a theory that's been going around for quite some time that says that perhaps the bond market and bond traders are front running um, what could be uh, another recession if, as a response to inflation, the Fed tries to taper and raise rates? I don't, I'm not very sure I subscribe to that theory. So they raise just... rates, if they raise rates, the bonds are not going to be rallying much from here. They can't. But, um... Yeah, but, but the logic tell you is the, the logic of that theory is that the bond market is in essence pricing in two moves for, two moves forward. Yes, yes. Right. But... So not the raising of rates, but what follows following that. And that's why I kind of fail to subscribe to that theory. You know what I mean? Because yeah. you suddenly have a market pricing in like uh, you know, two let's say two parts of the cycle forward without ever having even attempted to price in anything that, you know, th that precedes that, uh, you know, I, it, it seems too far. I, I think we're getting to a point where it's going to be one of the best risk reward trades. Uh, oh, um, I'm with you. I think uh, I, I'm looking at the Bund in particular. Remember, guys, when I was short, I shorted that, that what was the 177. And that was, and a, I, that was and a, I, a wonderful I, short. And, and I got out at 169 and changed. And I said, look, I wanted to go back to the, the, to the trend line resistance, which comes in at around 177, 178. And look, we're almost there. We're getting there. So yeah. I think that's going to be, I think that's going to be a really, really good. Uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, you know, one of the things well, actually, that yeah. I actually noticed this last week, Stelios, is um, we've broken above this uh, trend line. I was actually, I was looking at this, uh, it was actually this weekend. I'm sorry. Now I'm thinking, what day was I looking at this? Because I did the weekend analysis on the boons and, 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 I, and I was looking at, being, you know, being above the 200 day moving average. And I took this trend line, I'm like, I'm like, crap, we're going to break above that. And, and we are above it this morning. So you're, you're talking from a risk reward perspective. It might be a good short pretty soon. But today it's getting a little bit of a goose as we're back above that trend line. So let's uh, let me see where the. Yeah, I, I'm waiting for more like 177, 178. I think that's... Oh, that, would, that would be the uh, 177 or really close to that would be the 618 retracement. So that makes yeah. a lot of sense there. Um, that, that we might uh, probe into that area. So interesting. Uh, we have a couple of minutes before uh, before uh, Dale takes over and he brings, uh, Dale, who's coming in as your guest today? Peter Bukovar. No, not oh, no, Peter. Peter Goodburn. P Peter Goodburn. Peter, Peter Goodburn. Goodburn for, uh, uh, he's an Elliotitian guy. So, and that's also, he's, 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 he actually is really good. Um, it's always nice to, to hear Peter's view on the market. So he's going to be a great interview. Dale must have stepped away for just a second before he starts. I just want to mention that, guys, if you are um, it, it, lift, listening in here, maybe this is your first time. Welcome. Tomorrow, we actually have some pretty big news uh, uh, here at Forex Analytics. We're going to be um, uh, talking about something that's big for our company. Um, so make sure you're here tomorrow. Same time. So 23 and a half hours from right now be back here on this webinar because um, you'll hear what uh, our announcement. Just want to make sure I mention that. Steve, still, do you have any other, uh, any other last minute um, things that you want to mention to, to, uh, to, to every, anybody? I just wanted to say before people get really excited, oh yes, market's going down. This is the beginning of the bear market. Zoom out a little bit on the chart and you'll see it's still a little blip and with yields this slow, I kind of uh, still find it difficult to see how we're going to have a proper move lower with the yields down there. That's good. That's... Good, good point. And, you know, just again, let's just 
let's look at the the grand scheme of things. When you say it's a little blip, I mean, this is how little of a blip it is in the grand scheme of things. And we are nearing really key levels of support here. Uh, Steve, any, any last minute um, things that you want to mention? Any last words, Steve, before you go? <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you want for your last meal? Do you, do you know something I don't? <laughs> no, I, no, I just would. You know, this is a very important statement you make here. Go ahead. Yeah, so, um, listen, I, I've been saying that I expect some kind of a short-lived but sharp corrective move uh, during summertime. This might be the beginning of it, but as I said before, I think whatever it is, it's going to be rather short-lived, even, even if this is what we're talking about. Um, I, I don't really see the overall conditions having changed significantly. Having said all that, I really hope, because I think we all, we all do, that, you know, being a Monday, uh, this is the beginning of at least a week of volatility, because we all know that, you know, these are the type of trading conditions we want to have, right? Uh, yep. I'm not that optimistic, but I really hope it's not just a one day wonder once again. And, you know, we go back to boring markets from your All lips. Right. All right. Well, well said guys. Um, Famous hey, last words. If, <laughs> everybody else. If you're a Forex analytics subscriber, we'll see you on the morning edge in 45 minutes. We're going to go through all of the, and Stellar's you're going to, you're going to kill me here because I did not update the bias chart. Oh. I, 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 I made it for those of you that were here on Friday. I made it. I forgot to upload it to our system and I didn't realize till after I, I closed it down on my computer because you always upload it. I'm like, dang it. I forgot to do it. But That's guys, fine. we go through all the analysis of all the major currencies, all these instruments here and more um, in a 45 minutes if you're a Forex Analytics subscriber. So we'll see you there. Um, Dale, have a great interview. Okay, good hunting today, teammates. Welcome back, Peter Goodburn. How are you, my trading warrior brother? Dale, can you hear me? Waiting to hear you. Got hey, you, great, How are great, you? great to be with you. Thanks, Dale. And uh, yeah, greetings to, to Blake and Steve. Hi, guys. Hey, Peter. <laughs> how you doing? Hey, Peter. Good. All right. All right, Peter. So uh, you want to share your screen? Green button. Yeah, let's Zoom. try it. Let's try it. And, and uh, some interesting red action that we have going on here today. So my question to you is, and you know, uh, you and I kind of keep in touch. Uh, you know, I respect your your work a lot, Peter. And I'm wondering if last week's reversal, where I had a two week reversal where I just used to close from the prior two weeks. And if we close underneath it, it's a two week reversal. Was that enough for a reversal signature? What we saw last week, considering this week's uh, the, today's sell -off? Well, I think so. Um, first of all, I just like to confirm, are you, uh, can you see my S&P chart? Okay, Got I'm it. on the right screen. Okay, good. No, I think yeah, I think you're right. Um, I mean, maybe maybe we come to the same conclusion from a different angle, but from an Elliott perspective, uh, this morning's break below the previous week's low, I think it's really important because up until that point um, last week, the the rally from this 42.79.80 area, which I'm pointing to at the moment, up to the highs. Right. Last week was a was an intraday five wave pattern. Could have been the first wave of the fifth. It could have could have been the fifth in its completion. We wouldn't know until, of course, this morning we've broken below last week's lows, and that means that the fifth wave is is pretty much intact and finishing, and that we're getting confirmation. So it was kind of what I mean. It wasn't a uh, what they call a. It wasn't exactly a fifth wave failure because it made a new high. Would you call that a truncated fifth or? Or how would you label that last rally? Just a five. Yeah, right? it's no, it's no truncation. You get a truncation if the fifth okay. wave doesn't break above the third. The third wave's here. I here, see. And the fifth wave is up okay. Here. So this looks okay. So we've got, you know, there's two ways. There's actually a couple of ways to count this final leg up from 4029. You can either do it the way I've drawn it here, one, two, three, four, tiny fifth wave, or you can go to a diagonal and look at a rather extended fifth. In this case, this was the original targets that we had at 4367. 
and bases yeah. this one it could have squeezed up a bit higher but it hasn't so it's fallen in between a bit and it's breaking this residual low but that residual low here last week's low uh, at 42.79 and a, and, a, and a little bit means that having broken that this morning this is really decidedly bearish so we we've got to start putting on some shorts because i think that there's no chance for this to go back any higher anymore okay all right so uh um uh, after reading uh, your recent um, uh, views on the market, and I must say that you were early on the inflation, uh, reflation trade. Uh, remember, you talk about one more break in copper and then a big move and, uh, you know, and everything soared, uh, base metals, precious metals, everything. And now you're seeing that, uh, like everything else, uh, uh, nothing goes straight up or down. Uh, forever without uh, digesting uh, gains, consolidating gains. And I think what uh, you're looking for now with the S&Ps uh, is very dramatic and will most likely have impact on commodities as well. So um, there's, uh, Peter's, this is your longer term count, um, which, <clears throat> you know, I have to say, is the most bearish I've ever seen you, and I've been talking to you for over five years. Yeah, I think the um, the the context here is very important because um, even during last year's sell-off during the during the pandemic sell-off, let's have a look at, at that. Here it is. Here, I mean that was a hell of a drop. I mean, um, and uh, you know, we've if I just scroll a lot, scroll back a bit, you know, this is a an expanding flat pattern that actually goes back to the beginning of 2018, which is, okay. yeah. Um, so you can see that that was a pretty, here we go, back to 2018. We had yeah. wave, three waves down for wave A, B up and C down. And this yeah. was, um, you know, I mean, this is really huge. Um, but we're talking about an even bigger decline here now. And um, ordinarily that wouldn't, wouldn't be, I would have said at the beginning of last year when we started to signal that the markets were trending up again, that wouldn't have been an obvious aspect because the fifth wave from, from last year's pandemic low, we've got a target at 5,400. Normally you'd expect that move up to be very similar to the first wave as an expanding impulse. And when I, mean, when I, when I say an expanding impulse, what I mean by that is that you get a conventional five wave pattern with no overlap one of the waves is going to extend, and that's normally the third wave, which is about 80 to 85 percent of the time correct. So the third wave is dimensionally a lot bigger than the first or the fifth waves. And you can see that here in the third wave of intermediate degree. We begin from this point here back in 2011. We go all the way up to the 2018 high, and that's dimensionally a lot bigger than the first wave. And if our final forecast for the fifth, it's going to be you know, a lot bigger than the fifth wave as well. But um, if you look at the subdivision in the waves one and three, these are expanding impulse waves. They both contain the third wave, which is extended. But here, we've got a very different makeup into the final stage of the secular bull uptrend. Um, because last year's advance has been so exponentially rising, but it's done so in three price swings. In other words, it's subdivided into three price swings. And that's not how the first wave of intermediate degree unfolded, neither the third wave. They all started subdividing into fives. This one's threes. And the only time that you ever consider a three pricing event like this is if it's a diagonal. So you have two types of impulse waves, an expanding impulse, this one, or you can actually have a diagonal impulse, which has still five waves, but you get lots of overlap. And uh, the makeup of that is very interesting because the second wave demands very steep sell-off, a correction to the first wave. And normally the second wave is about sometimes 61.8%. I've often uh, defaulted more recurrence at 76% retracement. And that's how we come up with this very, very deep sell-off for a diagonal second wave before it starts to build up again later. So it means a big shock. I mean, don't forget that this movement up from pandemic lows has set really big records. I think this is the third biggest trajectory advance from a late, from a major low in a hundred years. Yeah, really was yeah. magnificent. Uh, 
I was selling rallies all the way up. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Peter, let me let me ask you this. Um, I know, uh, you know, a lot of people were looking for the dollar to get a bid during risk off. But what's interesting is the dollar started advancing before we got this break in S and P's, mm -hmm. and um, your target in S and P's, just in my imagination. I know you're looking for a higher dollar up to, yeah, there we go. Um, it doesn't seem like it would be enough of a dollar rally to justify um, 2,500 in the S&Ps. Uh, uh, so the, it, do you think that there's gonna be a time frame where the S&Ps could continue to go down after this uh, dollar rally completes, because you know we're only about, you know, uh, what, uh, you know, four, three, four points away from that uh, target into November, mm -hmm. or it just isn't going to take as much of uh, dollar strength uh, to generate that type of sell-off in the S and P's. Well, you know what it, I'm it, trying to reconcile. Well, don't worry. I've had three conversations with institutional clients this morning on the same subject. <laughs> okay. So yeah. you're in a good you're in good keeping with them as well okay. because they've said the same. Hey, look, you know, if we're looking at such a big sell-off in equities, yeah, well, shouldn't the dollar be a lot higher than 96 figure? Well, the, well, ordinarily it makes perfect sense to think that. I think we have to take it in stages. You know, uh, quite often um, the dollar does surprise. I mean, one of the big things which I had a discussion with a, with, a, with a major client who's running a $3 billion currency fund was back here. Well, actually, yeah, it was back here, um, pre-primary pre, uh, um, wave twos high at 103.82. If we scroll back a little bit, um, this consolidation pattern was, was quite big relative to, to the preceding upswing. And, yeah. and some, this particular client said to me, hey, Peter, um, Shouldn't the dollar go a lot, lot higher after such a broad consolidation of a sort of over 12 months? Shouldn't this really be breaking a lot higher? You've only got a target at 103.72. And shouldn't it, you know, once it breaks out of this consolidation, shouldn't it go a lot higher? And I said, well, no, basis to fit price ratio measurements um, uh, on the weeklies, it, sh it shouldn't do. Um, and he said, so we had a big, we had a big issue about that. And I'm going to show you now what resolved it, because if we go to, you know, a, a longer term chart, here's the dollar going back to pre-financial crisis lows. And the reason I said 103.77 well, it was, was my target. Back. And if we just extend this original move up like this by 61.8, yeah. this is what this is how you project the final conclusion of that correction. OK, so we had a. The target at 103 and this is the breakout area here so strange things can happen you know i mean you'd expect a consolidation pattern like that yeah maybe to get a lot higher it didn't these fit price ratios were very exact so when we come back to look at the um the shorter term picture i'm rather trusting in these fit price ratios and then and then tweak it as it's as necessary because you know conceptually you're right if the dollar if the if the s p collapses you think the dollar should do more than 96 but there's the there's the numbers again, and uh, and I think we have to we have to pay attention to that first and and see what develops. It yeah, might that's be. going to be a battleground for sure. Yes, it will. I mean, don't forget also. I've labelled this move up as a double zigzag. So you've got the first zigzag here, and I've extended that by sixty one eight. It's not impossible. It could extend into a triple zigzag. You know, if uh, somewhere during the decline in the S and P over the next several months, we get a um, a corrective upswing which is you know, gonna happen at some point. You know, the dollar index might drop down in the next wave like this and we'll get a third and final zigzag coming up to a hundred figure or something like that. It's not impossible. Okay. You know, okay. we don't have a crystal ball, but we can manage, we can man manage that pretty well, I think as long, along the way. Okay. Um, also along with this scenario and you know, I, I know you're an elitician, but it seems like it was uh, really all one market uh, since COVID, everything went up together with the dollar going down. And now it seems like with this bear market rally in the dollar, everything's going down. It's uh, different magnitudes and, and degrees. But I think uh, showing uh, our audience today uh, what you think could happen to certain commodity markets might save them some 
heartache. And you're you're not saying inflation's over. You're just saying that we're entering a pause in the inflation pop, and um, you know that there could be some pretty deep corrections in the commodity markets as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, one of the things which have caught you know the imagination of uh, inflation pressures um, is uh, I'm just going to show an extract of um, our mid-year report, um, and this is the inflation pop and where we are with the comparative. This is. Um, this is the, the latest PCI, you know, which of course is one of the Fed's proxies for understanding what inflation pressures are like. And we've gone exponential here. I mean, um, at the beginning of the year, back in April, we were still sort of quite low, um, but we did expect this sort of swing up. And it's got, just gone exponential. I think we're gonna raise this target. Um, here's the latest uh, PCI reading um, and 3.4%. Uh, so it's, it's gone basically well above what the Fed had predicted ba basically at the end of last year. They've had to revise their numbers, of course, recently. And here we've got some real yields, but the real yield is interesting picture because that's actually ticking down now. Right. We actually ticked up at the beginning of the year. That's what caught everybody's imagination. And they said, well, the year, real yield's actually moving up now. That's inflationary. You know, this thing is gonna go berserk. But actually we, we've had a pause and I tend to think that when we take a look at some of the food prices, which are a big impact in, uh, in the world for, for inflationary pressures, that's where everybody's going to feel it. You know, we can see that the, the oils have done, you know, extraordinarily, you know, it's got, they've gone really exponential, some of the oils in the, in the, in the food yeah. product area. And um, the only thing that's dragging behind is meat, but everything else is pretty high. And this is the... This is the food um, and agriculture uh, index itself, which um, is from, is from the, the United Nations body. And, and you can see how it's ticking up. We've got this target at 194. So this is gonna be a big push up in the next few years. So inflation pressures are still gonna be with us, but we're gonna be taking a little bit of a pause. And we can see that here in the DB Agriculture Fund. This is an ETF. So the upswing that we've seen since last year is, is probably ready to take a bit of a pause. I wasn't certain when I updated this, if um, we get a little bit of an uptick first and then a drop, or whether it drops immediately, because I noticed that in the very intraday picture, there was a little bit of a zigzag decline down here. But um, anyway, these charts are, are in our part two mid-year report. Actually, I can show you details later if anybody's interested in taking a video of this. But uh, this is just an extract, but I think that um, we are gonna take a pause. Uh, base metals, things like copper prices, which of course are you know, very, very much in the front end of, um, of our, our commodity research and certainly in the markets as well, is taking a bit of a pause. So if we take a look at copper prices at the moment, if I can find the right one. Yeah, this is it. And you can see that we're, we're in a regression point. You know, copper's had a very, very strong exponential rise since last year's pandemic low. And uh, this is LME three months, by the way, and I use it rather than, than COMEX because there's no gaps for the futures market. This is a seamless three month deferred spot contract, if you like. So there's no gaps. Anyway, the main thing is that it's dropping down and we should have a good retracement, somewhat limited retracement in a way. I was actually originally thinking that we might come a lot more, but if we take a look at the weekly chart on copper, um, you'll see that we need to, we, we're somewhat limited in what we can drop because here's the first wave. This yeah. is the advance in 2016. So we can't overlap with that. If it does, then we may have to come up with a diagonal, um, which is a bit like the S&P's picture from the last phase. So like this, so you, if it's a diagonal, you can, actually, you can actually bring this down a bit lower, not a huge amount lower. Well, it's Maybe. still 30% from the highs here, right? Yeah, it's still, it's still a lot, um, but you know, it's nothing, it's nothing quite as comparative to the S and P drop that I'm expecting. Yeah, S and P's look like they're going to have the biggest drop, but uh, aren't there other base metals? And I'm sure our, our audience want want to know what you're thinking in the precious metals as well during this time frame. Well, I think gold. Um, you know, we've been bearish for gold and silver since last year, and and the cycles were were giving us a bit of a clue that um, for for at least twelve month period. Um, the gold and silver and all that, uh, all the precious metals were basically trapping down. Silver's, um, you know, I think a very big thing. 
Uh, I love trading silver. I think I've, I've always been active in silver because I started trading this back in the late 70s uh, during the bunker hunt time. Yeah. And I was fascinated by what they were doing and the story behind their manipulations and stuff. So silver is really a big thing for me. I love it. Um, but one of the things which, um, if we take a look at silver, let's just trip back and show my charts a bit here. Yeah, this is, the thing is that silver is engaged in, in a triangle pattern. And it started last August back here. And we've got it as a descending type triangle. Quite uncommon, these patterns. Here's the bottom in the first drop down here at 2166. Then we come up into that February high which was all about the Reddit users uh, starting to push up. And then we start dropping down again. And we need to get um, at or close towards this 2166 area. The measurements that I've used actually come to 2174, which is pretty close. But you can see in the last couple of days, back in the last week and today again, still we're starting to accelerate down pretty hard now. And, um, and this is likely to sort of continue down, I think, for another couple of months or more. And, um, and that's a good proxy also, if you take a look at the gold-silver ratio and apply that to gold. So gold actually looks like, let's have a look, looks like, looks like this, coming down to about 1600. I think we're gonna get down here before we start having to buy gold again. I think we're gonna break below this uh, March-April lows down here. And we're gonna, we're gonna actually break those and get down in a final, a final zigzag pattern from the June high at 1916. So if you're trading gold and silver, I think there's gonna be much better opportunities to buy it. And don't forget also that, you know, if you're trading gold and silver, just make sure that you're intraday aware of what the rhythms are moving like in the dollar, because it's pretty much dollar, dollar based um, at the moment, it's dollar driven. Um, of course, there's sometimes, um, I mean, one of the reasons why gold has, has driven up from 1750 in the last month is because You've got lower yields in treasury yeah. yields, you know, and that's yeah. been a factor. A nice, a nice headwind, but hasn't helped it. Hasn't helped it last week and uh, the start of this week lower yields. No, I think that's because we've switched more emphasis to the dollar again, being okay. strong. Um, but Fickle you know, those are the trade. main drivers. You know, you've got to yeah. look for. And by the way, if you take a look at uh, GDX, you know, all of the miners are uh, showing us that uh, we've got yeah, they were so much they they didn't respond to bullion strength for a month yes and you know basically the uh, i mean the don't forget this is the this is the uh, august high last year so this actually topped out exactly when bullion gold topped out but these right. corrections you know we've still got to get down to these numbers around around about 28 on the gdx i think that would be as useful to buy down there somewhere Okay. Uh, one question I have, you know, classic technical analysis would uh, look at the descending triangle that you're showing in silver, silver. as a reversal formation or a topping formation. Um, if we start taking out the 2160 level on a closing basis, would that trigger the formation for being bearish if we took out that support? Well, I think probably not, no, okay. um, uh, because let's have a look at... Um, I'm so of, old school, but, no, uh, you is, know... This, this is the slightly bigger picture. Well, yeah. I mean... All right. No, I mean, okay, look, so, no, I think it's important to differentiate between certain key points of support and resistance, whether they break and whether they mean something or not. I mean, okay, okay a level today on the S&P has been broken from last week's lows. That, to me, right. is very important, but only from the perspective of the preceding pattern. Um, okay. you know, just because you're breaking a support or resistance level doesn't mean... Any, look, I mean, would you have bought, would you have bought silver on a break above 29.86, just because it's horizontal support resistance. No, you yeah. wouldn't do. Some because, did, yeah. Well, I'm sure some did, yeah. yeah. Um, break but, out. But, yeah. but I wouldn't do it, why? Because the preceding pattern indicated that this was a corrective double zigzag. So you wouldn't be buying on a breakout. You see some double zigzags or single zigzags that lead to a result in a breakout like this are, you know, um, are B waves of more broader patterns like a triangle or an expanding flat pattern. But you've got to know where you come from and what broader pattern that potentially is in, whether you okay. need to break it, you know, buy on the breakout or not. So you've got to do a bit of homework on your Elliott to understand that, whether to buy a breakout or not. Today's breakdown on the S&P is giving us the sell signal, but 
but it wasn't invertly like this on silver. If we broke down below 2166, would that be a sell signal? No, it wouldn't, um, okay. because, because a triangle can allow wave C to sometimes break out of the trading range slightly. Yeah. As long as it doesn't collapse, I mean, you know, yeah. so you'd have to look at the pattern and measure up and say, well, okay, we can allow a little bit more. For example, if we were to go slightly lower, um, what I would do would be to extend this by 61.8. And if it sort of, if it dried up around 2057, 2060, then the pattern looked okay. You might allow okay. that uh, to, to, to still you, maintain the uptrend, yeah. Getting a couple of requests uh, that we could uh, wrap it on, on your view of WTI, which uh, had another uh, tremendous rally. Uh, you know, people were scarred by seeing it go negative last spring and a year ago last spring. And, you know, I, I think that uh, even you, although looking for um, highs in this market, uh, it was a beast that kept grinding out new ones. And uh, looks like we may finally have something here, right? Well, I think so. I mean, the assumption uh, was that um, even though it was grinding up, I mean, this uh, this is an incredible move up from 57 and a quarter to, to, to this recent high, uh, just yeah. below 77. And it's I've got this docked as um, a three pricing event. So it becomes where you fear of an expanding flat. But I actually rolling the clock back to March when we got here, I thought that was already hitting top at the time. I thought that the market was already starting a correction in wave X with $39 being, being put in. And, okay. um, um, and, and it dropped down here and then broke the highs. And ever since then, we've been adopting this idea that maybe this is a zigzag, which it seems to be adhering to now. But the, the idea was that if stock markets start to turn down in a big way, which they seem to be confirming today, then oil would follow. And that seems to be- Oil led it. Also consistent. Oil peaked first, right? It did. It did. To some Except extent. for the Russell. Um, Russell was the earliest peak of anything, I think. But uh, uh, oil put in a secondary high last week, a lower high. So while the S&Ps were putting in their high. Well, that's what's been difficult this year, certainly from, from um, my Elliott perspective. You know, we had the Nikkei 225 index in Japan top out in February. We had the Russell top yeah. out in, in March. Right. Um, you know, and so you had immediately sort of bearish divergences, but look how long we had to wait yeah. for the S&P to top out. We've, you know, only had confirmation really today and it topped out basis last week's high. So, um, you know, you have to- And it to, took the Dow uh, to last week to take out its March high. That's right, that's right. And don't forget the dollar index bottomed in January. And right. I was getting already excited in January saying, well, if the dollar's bottomed, you know, the stock right. markets won't be too far behind, but that, you know, that we've had all these major divergences and that's been very tricky this year, I have to say. Yeah. But um, finally, this is coming to resolve. So I think crude oil is on its way down. I think we're going to get down to 39, 40 bucks, uh, somewhere okay. down there. Um, so hopefully- Well, great, presenta great presentation, Peter. Thank, thanks. Oh, okay, yeah. if you want to throw up for the crypto people, um, uh, oh, yeah. your Bitcoin chart. I, actually, yeah. I mean, Jane. let's take let's take a quick- a quick peek and see how and that's doing. And then I want you because... to show your website so people know how to follow you. Great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that would be good. Um, well, cryptos. Yeah. Well, we had a great call earlier this year. We did we did pick out the top pretty well because we uh, had seen initially some declines down here in March. But we picked up the double zigzag um, up here and we said, right, that's really bearish. Now, I can see that we're starting to break below this 30,000, well, it's not quite broken yet, 30,500. Let's have a look at it here. This is really, really critical, 30,549. If we break that, and you imagine it might be possible because the only reason risk Bitcoin off. is coming off is, yeah, it's all about the risk off. Then yeah. we're gonna have to start looking at uh, the final downside push with this diagonal coming back from this May high down to 26,378. So be aware that if we, you know, if we do take that oil out, which it does look likely now, doesn't it? That we're going to end up at 26,378. We're going to have to sort of come down to these numbers, I think, before we start heading up in a bigger way. Um, there was, you know, sometimes, you know, it's difficult if, um, uh, because Bitcoin, what, what fundamentals do you follow? You can't. I mean, 
there's very little fundamental news flow. The institutions are playing this game now, but they have very little information news. So they're all trading the tech side and the technology, right. uh, the, 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 the technical analysis side. Um, there's no, they, you know, you don't know whether or not uh, there's going to be positive correlation with stock markets, risk on, risk off. Um, we've seen it diverge during this phase at one point. And then we yeah. had the collapse, of course, which was definitely divergent to the S&P, for example. China banning it, you know, I mean, you know, that's a fundamental. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, that was a good piece of information news, um, but there's not day-to-day -day news flows like that coming right. out, you know, like you would trade FX or, you know, stock markets. So it gets right. a bit tricky. So I can understand, I can understand why you've got to sharpen your pencil a little bit and, and do your work on your analysis. From an Elliott perspective though, if we start to break that secondary low here, I think we'll come down to 26.30. So you're gonna to have to come out, if you're long, you're gonna to have to come out and you're gonna to have to sit tight and wait. I think there's great opportunities going forward though. Um, I don't think that we're in any bear market at all. Um, I think okay. cryptos has got a pretty bright future. And you know, some of our long-term or longer-term stuff looks a bit like this, you know, they're going way up. So if you wanna see yeah. some of our work and a little bit more detail, you know, um, then you can, yeah, tap into some of our reports. For example, um, wavetrack.com is our main hub, and you can go here. And um, we have some information. We just published our mid-year reports um, for stock indices and commodities, and they're very low, low, low end uh, spec uh, price levels, price points. So I think uh, about forty-eight bucks. Uh, and some of the videos are lasting up to two, two and a half hours. Um, so, and they've got tons of information because you can actually download the PDF reports with all the charts in. So they're great. Or if you want some uh, shorter term updates, uh, go into um, our main page and look under subscriptions. So if you click on the subscription tab and you can see the Elliott Wave Compass report we publish twice a week and that's $39 a month. And uh, you'll find all our latest Bitcoin, dollar and stock indices in there plus a bit of uh, gold and silver and crude oil, of course, as well. Thank you so much, Peter, for coming uh, over the years and and giving us your time, your most valuable currency. I, I appreciate it very much, my trading warrior brother. Great. And Thanks, someone's Andy. saying Peter is definitely one of the higher caliber guests you have on DP. Great read on the market. Well, that's great. Okay. Thanks a lot yeah. for that feedback. That's you know, I, nice I saw a tweet. I saw a tweet <laughs> where, you know, it's not just your forecasts. Some guy tweeted that uh, they've learned and you've helped them develop as Elioticians with uh, explaining your work. So great. that's even great. That's even better. So. That's good for me to know. Yeah, because yeah. I'm, I'm very I'm very much in the in the tutorial mode. So I'd like to make sure that everybody's learning something you know that's how we progress ourselves take self-responsibility with your trading always but always to do your homework well and get as much good advice as you can and then you've got a good chance that you're going to be there consistently at the end great stuff thank you my trading warrior brother have a thanks. great week peter thanks dale thanks to everybody thanks for the boys as well good luck right. with everything and uh, we'll speak soon hopefully yeah we will all right, so that's a wrap, everyone. You know how to find Peter at wavetrack.com. And uh, we'll see everyone for Turnaround Tuesday. So don't just count your Elliott waves, count your blessings, and we'll see you all tomorrow. Thanks again, Peter. Adios. Adios, man. Take care.